Today you've chosen to learn about the lumbar spine, one of the more common areas or complaints that you'll see in your office. Let's take a look at how to examine a lumbar spine. We don't even want to start at the lumbar spine. We want to do what the peripheral nerves do that come out of the lumbar spine and go down the legs. The L4, L5, and S1 nerves that do reflex, motor, and sensory function. Let's look at the reflex first. The first reflex we test is the patella jerk. It's an L3-4 reflex arc, and by comfortably seating the patient, 90 degrees of hip flexion and knee flexion, the legs dangle, one can isolate the patellar tendon directly below the inferior pole of patella, strike it with the reflex hammer, and even feel the top of the quadriceps contraction with your other hand. Look at the symptomatic and the asymptomatic side, compare the two. Let's look at the next reflex, the S1 reflex, the gastroc soleus unit, or the plantar reflex. Here you take a foot, gently dorsiflex it to a neutral position to put the gastroc soleus on some tension. About a finger breadth above the Achilles insertion into the calcaneus is where you strike it with the reflex hammer. Brisk contraction, slow relaxation, a normal reflex. Compare the right versus the left. That's normal or abnormal. Let's go to the next thing that peripheral nerves do in the lower extremity, the motor function. Let's examine the quadriceps first. Here with the leg fully extended, the quadriceps actively flexed, you can stabilize that so the knees in extension, two finger breaths at the level of the ankle, you cannot break a normal quadriceps versus the other side with some notable quadriceps weakness, the same area, two finger breaths at the ankle, and with good pressure, you can break a quadriceps that someone needs to walk on, but you can break it with two finger breaths in motor weakness. Let's go to the next level down, the L5 distribution. It does two important muscles, the extensor hallucis longus and the anterior tibialis. Here, by dorsiflexing the foot maximally, you can put a finger or two finger breaths on the extensor hallucis longus, the big toe, and you should not be able to break a normal L5 anterior tibialis extensor hallucis longus group. As opposed to the other side with notable weakness in an L5 distribution, by pushing on that big toe, he will slowly give way to motor weakness. That's L5 radiculopathy. The last group tested is the S1 or gastroc soleus motor unit. By pointing just like a ballerina would do, you dorsiflex maximally on the foot. You cannot break a normal gastroc soleus unit. However, move to the symptomatic side where you have notable weakness. One can break the gastroc soleus with two fingers underneath the sole trying to dorsiflex the foot. Let's do the very last thing that radicular nerves do, and that's sensory function. There's only three areas in the leg that matter, all of them below the knee. One finger breath versus the other finger. Light touch sensation is the only thing that matters. You can examine the autogenous zone from L4, right side versus left. You can examine the autogenous zone from L5, right side versus left. And last, the S1 distribution on the side of the foot. These are all areas that you just want a subjective notation from the patient. Does it feel more or less? An injured nerve will always be less. Of course, no test would be complete for the back without a provocative straight leg raise test or a Lasig maneuver. Here, the patient comfortably is supine on the table, completely relaxed. This is a passive test. Lift the leg up, not somewhere between 30 and 70 degrees, there should be no clinical response of any leg pain at all. If you're not sure, dorsiflex the foot, pull down on the foot. It should increase sciatic nerve tension and be more provocative. And then lastly, flex the hip and knee up to 90 degrees, total relaxation of the sciatic nerve. Now you know what the patient's responses are on the normal side. Let's now test the side he complains about, abnormal side. Now you take a completely relaxed leg, somewhere between 30 and 70 degrees, he'll tell you to stop, ask him where it hurts. Backside of the calf, below the knee, is where the sciatic nerve will present itself, S1 or L5. Now if you're not sure again, dorsiflex this foot again. It should provoke the sciatic nerve tension even more, 
provoking a painful response on the part of the patient. Now do the relaxing maneuver, flex the hip, flex the knee 90 degrees, all the sciatic nerve tension has gone away. That's a straight leg raise maneuver. And of course, no examination would be complete without looking at the back or examining ranges of motion. Here's how to examine someone and gain an effort of bony anatomy of where you are in the lumbar spine. Your hands on the iliac crest should be directly at the L4-5 interspace. A level above it, L3, a level below it, S1. Now you know exactly where you are. You can see or feel the erector spinae or the paraspinal muscles. Palpate those with your thumb. Are they in spasm? Are they tight? Range of motion, lateral bends left, should equal lateral bends right. That's normal. And then lastly, what you want to do is look from the side of somebody's lumbar lordotic curve that straightens and then becomes kyphotic as they forward flex, arms outstretched to touch their toes. Watch here a couple of times how he goes from lordosis to straight to kyphosis. That's again a normal finding. Your documentation and your clinical notes of the pertinent positives and negatives with what you find on your physical examination is how you help Texas Mutual define the extent of the work injury. Thank you for watching Workplace Diagnosis.